Welcome guys to my second video from this series. Here is Samuel Vidam and today I want to take you with me into a journey into the history and so we can both learn about our actual financial system. Yes, so like I said in the last video, I would describe these things that you now hear in the media as the bad fruits of a bad tree that have just ripened. Now there is a picture, a good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bears bad fruit, and the bad tree is only good for being cut down and thrown into the fire. So basically, I would say that our today's financial system should be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's pretty hard, right? So if we take a closer look at, at it, we will see the fruits of the tree of the financial system are growing debt, among other things, global speculative bubbles, or an ever-increasing concentration of power from a few corporations. Now, these bad fruits are borne by a root, and this is the financial industry that works with two drivers, fear and greed. Expropriating and incapacitating people, and like with any other tree, we have a situation that there is something underground that you cannot see. Now, the source strength of this tree, the origin of this financial system, lies in the love of the money. And also in the approach, how can I earn as much as possible and do as little as possible? And in addition to this tap root, there are about other strong roots that give system strength especially money that does not belong to God and the philosopher's stone, which I like to call it the miracle increase or the eighth wonder of the world. It's called the compound interest. So first of all, I would like to clarify the term money because money is not the same as money we know today. The traditional money is a commodity money that is a rare or very important goods for example, gemstones, silver, gold, or an important commodity such as corn or animals were also used as a medium of exchange. Now, the oldest evidence of this is several thousand years before Christ. And besides this commodity money, there were also a loan money from the beginning. So here you simply did not immediately provide a return service, but promised something and it was written down in wood, engraved on clay tablets, or something like that could also be made viable, which is then called the change. And with that change, you have a loan of money. So basically, this was a covered loan money because the one who keeps his promise come to the situation that is delivered and then the bill is torn apart, the credit money expires and the deal is over. Now, today's money is a so-called uncovered loan money. You could also say fiat money or, pay close attention, legalized counterfeit money or simply monopoly money. Banking began at the Babylonian temple. Now, since the commodity money began to be measured, the oldest units of weight are Chaldeanian and Babylonian. There are so-called mina, shekels, and talent. And from there on, money has made development steps around the globe and then flowed into what we call today the financial system. We see throughout the scriptures that God also speaks about it and he makes fun of the Babylonians. We see that the king Belshazzar, where when his reign ended, the angel wrote, Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. What he meant was mina, mina, shekel, and half mina. And then the prophet Daniel comes and then gives the interpretation and says, counted, weighed, and found too light, and so your kingship will be taken from you. So basically you could say that this was the first judgment on the Babylonian financial system. It is later on that the king of Greece started standardized precious metal units in Greece around 600 before Christ. Now, precious metal has emerged relatively quickly as the standard means of payment, in particularly silver. So what did he do? He had his face picture stamped 
on such standardized weight units and created the coin with it. Now later on, Jesus refers to this story in the Gospels, of which there are three, see now in Mark chapter 2. But very quickly explained, the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus by asking him, Shall we pay taxes or not? And in itself, Jesus does not answer the question at all, but gives a teaching about money that they did not understand. Therefore, the event closes with them very, very, very surprised. Now, Jesus says, show me a tax coin. And they gave him a denarius and he says, because on this denarius is the picture of the emperor, this denarius belongs to the emperor and therefore not to God. Now, in order to understand which meaning lies in this statement, we have to use another Bible verse from Haggai 2.8. In Haggai 2.8, he says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. And if we now consider that at that time, the denarius was a pure silver coin, Jesus says at this point, because this piece of silver is actually God's, here now, with a sign on it, no longer belongs to God, but to the emperor. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a very strong statement. Maybe a farmer can understand this the best because he puts sign on his herd, branding back then, or today they use a chip and that decides whether the animal belongs to his herd or not. In Revelation, this thought is also applied to people. That is, people will also receive a sign and this sign is either the seal of God or the mark of the beast. So let's move on. I would like to briefly describe now at least some of the further development steps to make it clear how it could happen that we accepted such uncovered money or fiat money or illegalized counterfeit money. It was the Chinese who first created this state paper money out of the mentioned exchanges in 1000 AD after Christ and finance war. The Chinese got away from it relatively quickly, however, because they have experienced several hyperinflations in quick succession. And in fact, China was the country that had silver as the standard currency until 1930. This knowledge of paper money or fiat money can work for at least a limited time. And that is for the one who owns it had, has great advantages. It came to Europe and was picked up there by private merchants who partly even founded secret societies with the explicit aim of establishing this uncovered money in Europe. It was in the 17th century when these people's efforts were somehow successful and they created today's financial system. In 1608 or 1609, the world's first central bank was specifically established in Amsterdam with bank guilders, which the city of Amsterdam guaranteed a standard silver currency unit created a virtual currency unit which allowed a ledger and fiat money system to be established across Europe. Now the different currencies could also be traded in one another without any problems. They could swap. A few years later, it was in Sweden, the world's first central bank was founded in the mid 17th century. The next step then took place in Sweden city where the banker Paul Strzok got permission from the Swedish king to issue notes as official money. These notes worked for a full six years when too many Swedish bank notes owners tried to exchange them again during the copper crisis. He had guaranteed gold redemption and he couldn't. He was then sentenced to death. Pause. So the first central banker in the world was sentenced to death. He was later on pardoned and thus sentenced to life imprisonment. And then started in the 17th century, so to speak, the various efforts to establish this fiat money in Europe. 
So when the Bank of England was founded, it led to a breakthrough for today's financial system. It was again Dutch merchants who went over with William von Oranje, who then took over the British crown and where he got permission to found the Bank of England. Now let me say this to you. The Bank of England can be rightly called the mother of all central banks because this model was then exported worldwide and is still in use today. Now the Bank of England, you shall not imagine that it was so quickly ready as the central bank that we know it today. But it took many small steps that led to the fact that the bankers received the privileges of wealth and monopoly of on money they have today. A very important step in order to keep this fiat money, paper money in circulation at any time was that you no longer had to redeem it. So in other words, they got this privilege at some point that they no longer had to exchange for silver and gold. Again, don't imagine that the Bank of England, in one step, it became this powerful central bank according to the model of which all central banks function. But these were very small steps that the financial merchants, the kings and the parliaments adopted. So in 1819 was actually the final step because up to this point the paper money had already been established as regular state money, so to speak accepted and approved by the state. But up to this point this fiat money was still measured in gold and silver and that was finito now, done now. Why? Because sterling was introduced in 1819. And with the pound sterling, the English gold coin was no longer measured in a certain amount of silver, as were the case before, that it was shown in the form of 15 silver shillings, but in the form of a pound sterling. Now, the name of this currency, unit alone, is pure fraud. Now, if we imagine the pound, if we recall, the mina is one of the oldest weight units for currencies and sterling has been a simple term for silver in Europe since 800 AD. And so the banknotes suggested sterling. Right from the start, there was a conscience claim to silver, which was never the case. So basically we see here again that the deception continues. Yes, we have completely different currencies than the pound sterling now because it was eventually replaced as a world reserve currency by the US dollar. But basically all currencies work according to this model. Now the bad thing is that we are used to these currencies to accept nothing as a measure of value. If I say how much is this value, then you answer 20 euros. If I say how much is this value, then you answer 200 Swiss francs. And here actually lies the scam, the fraud and the deception of the last 400 years. So really, I must say that it can be overwhelming to hear that something has been established under our eyes the whole time over the centuries, not only in one country, but worldwide. But the good thing is that God does something. And in the next video, I'm going to talk possible answers. So guys, if you like this video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like, share and comment. Let's bring awareness and I promise that I will make more videos like this to bring more value and probably, who knows, people will wake up and escape the slavery, the modern slavery. Until then, until next time, have a beautiful, beautiful day. Be much blessed.